Thanks a lot. And now I pass the voice to our commentator, uh, Stanisław Tyszka. Uh, thank you very much. Um, well, first of all, I'm very, very happy uh, about this panel. Uh, I know that probably for, for most people, uh, some of the papers were um, more difficult or less uh, interesting than others, uh, but uh, that's precisely what I tried to do with my research, so combining the legal perspective and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and collective memory studies. Um, so um, I, I would like to, to give some uh, background information at first uh, to the question of restitution in Poland uh, to, to comment on, uh, on the presentations by Mr. Vrubel and uh, Ms. Katana. Um, <coughs> the question of restitution in general in the region is a question of continuity or discontinuity or the level of discontinuity with the previous regime. So uh, even though there was there were everywhere, and uh, in this particular case in Poland, the new constitutional principles, among uh, uh, others the, 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 the rule of law, uh, the question was what the rule of law means. And here referring to the, to the presentation, very interesting one by uh, Martin Romanowski, uh, you can see how the uh, rule of law was uh, interpreted by the, by the constitutional court in, in Germany. Uh, in Poland, the application of new principles to the question of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, nationalization um, went this way, that the, Poland is the only country in the region that did not accept any, any general law on restitution. The restitution principle is that uh, is very much based on the continuity of legal systems uh, and the reinterpretation of, uh, of uh, communist laws from the perspective of new constitutional principles and new interpretation of the, of the rule of law. Uh, so restitution is theoretically, legally possible only when the communists violated their own laws according to the new interpretation of the rule of law. Uh, it's, uh, uh, well, as a concept, it's, it's, it's pretty it's pretty clear, but uh, as you could see from two presentations, the, the matter is extremely complicated uh, in, in legal sense. It's, it's so technically complicated that you have to be a specialist in a very, very own, uh, uh, and, and live from that to, to, to know the, all the intricacies for, of the Bierut decree. Oh, there are okay, a few specialists in Bierut decree, but the question of Tatra Mountains is an is a even more narrow thing. So here you have this legal history that is still living, which is also interesting from the perspective of memory. Well, in the countries that decided to adopt uh, some uh, law on restitution, they closed this legal history and uh, adopted new principles at, at least to, uh, to a larger extent. Um, there was no obligation uh, in the countries I was interested in on the constitutional level, like Poland, Germany, or, uh, or, or Czechoslovakia, then Czech Republic and Slovakia, to return property. Uh, there is no obligation on international level. So uh, I'd like to correct uh, uh, Ms. Katana here that there is no uh, possibility that, un unless the Polish government moves, that something can be done about uh, property in Warsaw. Um, the, Poland was forced to adopt one law on compensation for property left beyond the Bung, the Bug River, but that was precisely based on the question of continuity of legal entitlement. Because of the continuity with the communist state, the uh, the, the government was forced to uh, implement really implement the uh, uh, the uh, the laws uh, on compensation for property left beyond the Bug River. That was went back to the to the agreement with the Soviet Union between the Polish People's Republic and the Soviet Union. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to tell you just a few things on, on, on my research. I, I, I presented that two years ago, so I, I won't repeat it, but uh, I analyzed uh, restitution in the Czech Republic and in Poland, uh, and I was interested in, 
in, in the general debates on, on restitution, in which I, uh, uh, I, I analyzed uh, the binary oppositions that structured both national debates, such as restitution versus privatization, backward-looking justice versus, versus forward-looking justice, historical justice versus social justice, sanctity of property rights versus relativism of property rights, and finally, particular victimhood versus universal victimhood. In that matter, I was very much influenced by Professor Lazar Barkan, and, uh, and the Guild of Nations, um, because um, ultimately, the, uh, when I went further to analyze restitution claims in both countries made by uh, Jews, Germans, Catholic Church, and aristocracy, a kind of hierarchy of victims uh, appeared from, uh, from the public debates. Um, and um, now I'd like to move to the, the question of, uh, of law and memory. And uh, I, I, my first question would be to, to Kate Korinsky. Um I'd like to cite Jerzy Przybań, uh, who will join us tomorrow. Uh, forgetting the non-legal sources, sources of legality supports the self-legitimation of law in stabilized modern societies. In times of complex social changes and reconstructions, however, people retreat to entirely opposite strategy in the field of legality. The self-legitimation and reproduction of law are interrupted, and instead of forgetting, memory has the primary importance. Any complex political change initiates the perspective which takes law as a highly political normative system that must be re redefined and reconstru reconstituted. In times of complex social and political change, social memory reveals the non-legal sources and conditions of legitimacy of law. Uh, so my question would be, and I return to the discussion we, we had once, the, uh, the question of uh, how is your uh, uh, concept of relations between law and memory related to the uh, question of uh, ordinary justice versus extraordinary justice and in transitional justice. Um, uh, in your paper, you discuss the question of law in books and law in action. For my research, an important concept was the one b formulated by Adam Podgorecki, a famous Polish legal sociologist. He uh, wrote about uh, social control of the third degree. Uh, this is a great concept for understanding how, uh, uh, how property restitution worked in Poland. Uh, social control of the third degree is a situation in which groups of people use the legal means of control in order to realize their aims, their objectives, and not the aims that were uh, assigned to them by the, by the legislator. Uh, this is what happened in Poland with restitution because of this incredibly compl complex uh, legal situation and the hundreds of, uh, of laws decrees uh, going back to the 40s. Uh, uh, Podgorecki also used the term dirty togetherness, so little mafias that uh, use these uh, uh, links with the, from the, coming from the former regime, uh, lawyers, uh, public officials, and, uh, and they regain property uh, for their own uh, sake. Um, so uh, I, I wonder how, uh, how the question of relations between uh, law and memory relates to this very particular situation of uh, transitional justice where, uh, where th this flux uh, uh, in positive law is, is great. Um, I would like to ask uh, uh, Mr. Vrubel about to, to, to develop maybe a little bit on, on the very interesting issue of the, of the memory issues and the, and the representations of history. Um, uh, of the uh, of the national uh, park uh, and any actions taken by the claimants uh, in terms in legal terms and uh, also in other uh, using other instruments to influence the the, the public debate and um, and Martin Romanowski I, I wonder if, if there were any uh, similarities differences in how uh, German constitutional court and Polish constitutional uh, tribunal viewed 
uh, interpreted the question of rule of law in context of uh, changes in uh, property relations and, and restitution, and also if there were, how big was the issue in terms of public debate, uh, the issue of uh, 45, 49 uh, expropriations. Thank you. So, sorry, I suggest we answer the question uh, in the order they were asked, so we start with Kate. Okay. Oh, no, no. So your no. question was the first one. Okay, it doesn't yeah. matter. No. Okay, it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. Yeah, please. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, <laughs> no, I mean it. <laughs> um, social control of the third degree. Um, I don't know how to answer this. I, I. Um, if maybe I should start from the idea that law is in flux. Well, when is law not in flux? I mean, law is always in flux, and I don't necessarily think that if we're talking about Poland, that Poland is actually in a state of a transitional law. It's been 25 years. How many legal acts have been passed, Ella? Um, 30,000. Um, I, um, I don't necessarily think that um, distinction between transitional law and, and, and non-transitional law would make any difference to my theory. Law renders moral judgments. It does so for the benefit or to the detriment of whoever chooses to use law, be it little uh, criminal networks or the state, a large criminal network, as some would call it, uh, or not. Uh, so I, uh, I don't necessarily think that the distinction would change the possibility. As I say, this is a theoretical working out. I mean, I'm not, you know, I would, this would need to be tested, and I welcome your views on this. But this idea that the moral judgment is passed by an institution that's not inherently moral uh, is, is, is kind of the clue of my argument. Uh, but it can be used by, uh, and that, that's connected to the fact that memory is not positively loaded. I mean, memory can, be, can work for the benefit of groups that are not wholesome, if you will. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, well, to, to at first answer the question about um, uh, developing the issue of uh, memory. Uh, it's a difficult question, but not only for me, but also for uh, for the claimants. Uh, well, I would I would simplify it to uh, to the statement that to to have a memory, uh, we need to have uh, well some kind of knowledge about about the past. Uh, in this issue, we still uh, do not do not know. Uh, for example, we do not know if uh, the expropriation was or wasn't motivated politically. Uh, as uh, what what do we know is the uh, the justification wasn't wasn't clear. With the uh, what happened, we can we can call the uh, axiological neutralization of law. So uh, uh, so we still uh, do not do not uh, know. What was the real reasons of uh, of the expropriation? So uh, the memory of of uh, the people harmed by the expropriation is shaped not on the ground of uh, some kind of uh, knowledge, scientifically based knowledge, but uh, on a number of uh, prejudices, uh, opinions, and it's a mixture of. Uh, uh, of those kind of things, so uh, obviously it differs uh, from the person, but uh, it's uh, uh, it's usually based by the by the uh, on the opinion that uh, the expropriation actions was uh, highly politically involved uh, and uh, done in order to uh, harm uh, uh, local communities. So. Uh, that's that's uh, how I, I would say it. Uh, it was shaped, but obviously, uh, is, uh, question about uh, memory is also uh, an issue which is uh, very complex because of uh, because of the uh, time that uh, elapsed from 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 the moment of expropriation. So it will be differ different in different generation and. Uh, Probably even even will go uh, to 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 be forgotten in in the future. Uh, 
about the action taken by the claimants well first of all in 90s they uh, they were seeking a, a legal way of uh, regaining uh, the property uh, they did not succeed it uh, now this issue came back with the uh, with the uh, privatization of uh, uh, of the company which is operating a uh, lift on the uh, Mount Kasprowiewiech. So uh, now they uh, they said that they will uh, go uh, to the court once again to uh, try to regain uh, the land connected with, uh, with this uh, company. But obviously they, they also took a number of uh, actions uh, by by the mm, different means of media and uh, uh, all the all the actions taken by the climates were uh, trumpeted by by media newspapers internet media as well uh, actually I, I I can say that uh, it probably did not help them that much and it uh, more uh, created the uh, image of uh, quarreling people who uh, want something, but uh, not, not enough knowledge was uh, transferred by uh, mm, by the media uh, due to due to due to the actions taken by the claimants. Uh, I hope I answered your question. Martin, if you could answer. Thank you very much. The second question, a public debate about expropriation in the years 1945-49 was a part of the general debate about open property issues, because in Germany there was the whole range of different restitution regulations, especially the property law. But the debate I've referred to in courts and in literature, in the legal literature, was, well, it, it was a heated debate because it pertained to a very important group, the group very important before the Second World War, like big land owners. It was connected with international policy issues. And the main problem there could be boiled down to whether the reservation was true. I mean, the reservation by the Soviet Union, the reservation I referred to during negotiation uh, on reunification, because the tribunal left room for maneuver for the government to assess during negotiations to assess what activities should be taken by the government so that the reunification takes place. And Minister Klaus Kinka, the then minister, when these judicial decisions were made, and it was the current situation back then. Well, it was undermined later on during the debate in Germany, especially there was a book by Constanze Pafrat, Macht und Geigentum, which was in English authority and property, published in 2004. It was a detailed analysis of the whole process of negotiations with the Soviet Union, with the Democratic Republic of Germany. And she was trying to undermine the truthfulness of, the, of this reservation, suggesting that there was a kind of plot that the Federal Republic didn't care about restitution of property that used to be expropriated. So it used this reservation very willingly, actually, and agreed to a suggestion by the Soviet Union. Well, I don't want to say whether she was right. Uh, but it is not highly likely that she was right. Because uh, justification by the government uh, looks quite convincing. Anyway, the Constitutional Tribunal in Germany, knowing about all these doubts, knowing about all these doubts uh, connected with the reservation by the Soviet Union, maintained the position that it was due to the government, it, it, that it, it was to be assessed by the government 
which activities were appropriate to obtain the superior goal of reunification. If the reservation was not real, so despite the protest by the Federal Republic, the Soviet Union would have still agreed to the reunification, but according to the tribunal, the Federal Republic government believed the reservations of the Soviet Union was a real threat. But the whole problem, if I may refer to the, the whole discussion, the whole debate on open property issues in Germany, in this example, other um, people who were expropriated after 1949 were given too much. I know it's a strong statement, but they were given too much. It was restitution in kind. And then a problem arose of equality. How to do give these benefits, compensatory benefits, to all groups of the injured so there is still this equality at law that it is taken into account? And it was the cause, the real cause uh, of the whole dispute. As for the second question about some similarities of the federal courts, uh, federal constitutional courts in Germany and the Polish uh, constitutional tribunal, similarities in their decisions. Well, I would say um, it is difficult to see these similarities because the situation was basically different. And now I'm saying about the legal solutions. The German tribunal, constitutional courts, focused on solutions that had been adopted, whereas the Polish Constitutional Tribunal was more focused on some gaps or legal loopholes that were really there. And what you can see in judicial decisions of the tribunal is a certain trend for reprivatization, which which is sometimes called like that, namely that the tribunal interprets old legal regulations on expropriation in a manner which is friendly to the former owners. There is an example of the judicial decision of the tribunal in which it is stated that plots which were divided before the war only administratively, but there was no transfer of property rights, and the division led to diminishing the surface of the plot below below the size which was then subject to expropriation is still sufficient. This division is still sufficient and it was not absolutely necessary to have the, uh, the transfer of property rights. It is So it is not as it is literally written in the expropriation law, but it is interpretation by the constitutional tribunal, which is very friendly for the former owners. It is also true about the judicial decisions of the chief administrative courts, and there are several judicial decisions which are very friendly to former, former owners. So yes, perhaps it is a similarity, but the situation is totally different. To sum up, I would like to just say one more thing, that the Polish Constitutional Tribunal had one, uh, one remark when there was the law on restitution of property to the church, to the Catholic Church, and the Polish Constitutional Tribunal had a certain idea which seems very important to me, namely that it's treated the regulation as part of the future complex regulation. I'm not saying it will be just one law, but a complex body of laws uh, for reprivatization. So it was an idea that it is a complex solution. It is due to the legislator and not due to the courts. It is the legislator's job, actually, because courts cannot, and I believe it would be very difficult for courts, and they cannot solve all these problems because they are connected with some political factor. There is not only a political and not only a legal aspect, but also a political aspect to that. If I may, I'll be very brief, and I will refer to your comments. Thank you very much for your remark. 
perhaps uh, I was very brief in my explanations because I did not mean that there were any international pressures from the outside. My point was rather that there was educational and social role of judicial decisions because I would say that in Poland it is noticeable that there is no democratic tradition of a democratic tradition is not very long and it led to the situation that we do not have a proper public debate as Marcin Wrubel was saying that those trying to regain the property are presented in a very superfluous way as uh, people who, are, who I don't know who want to quarrel and are very combative so the media coverage is not focusing on the core of the matter. Perhaps the decisions of the European Tribunal will play the educational role and remind, of, remind us of the fact that the property rights is actually, or the right to property is part of human rights. And for many years, it was undermined under the previous political system in Poland, which was manifested in the following way. For example, you had an individual property, a social property, so there were different types of property. And it was very easy to be deprived of, of that. And the public opinion or the society as such which may exert some pressure on the uh, on different types of authority it may be reminded that compensation of damages is in compliance of democracy and we were striving to attain democratic rule for many years during the communist regime and we should try to to follow these goals now we're for the discussion questions Okay, we start here. Great, thank you. Uh, I want to direct my question to uh, everyone who's talked about restitution, both in Poland and in Germany. In, in all of Eastern and Central Europe, I think there has been um, uh, an additional player, third parties, who are the beneficiaries of the restitution. So the people who uh, uh, oh. occupy. Uh, yeah, and uh, if you, is it on? Because the, I think the interpreters cannot hear you. Czy możemy prosić o nowy, o drugi mikrofon? Sorry. I'm sorry, if you could start again. Yes, you can hear me now. Okay. I can hear myself, at least. <laughs> um, in all of the appropriate um, expropriations of property in Eastern... Take your, take your headset on. Yes. <laughs> um, in all of the appropriate expropriations of property in Eastern and Central Europe, I believe there's been um, a third party to these um, disputes that I, I don't think um, uh, any of you have discussed, or not in any depth at least, that is those who are the beneficiaries, um, not the people whose property were expropriated, not the state itself, um, but these third parties um, to whom property was transferred, either as lessees, uh, people who leased property uh, from the state, or, or as uh, owners of um, um, free title, uh, full title. Um, who purchased the property from the state. And I understand that in several of these countries, um, there have formed um, associations of such beneficiaries as political actors. I know Nadia's paper <coughs> discusses this in regard to the, um, uh, a couple of countries, the Czech Republic, I believe. And, um, and so I'm curious what role these third parties, who clearly have a great deal to lose, have a great deal to lose through the um, return of property of which they've been the beneficiaries. What role they um, have played, if any, and what kinds of arguments, um, I realize you're not lawyers if I understand correctly, what kinds of uh, normative arguments, legal or moral, more generally, they have raised that they were presumably, um, it was mentioned, the possibility of being a, a good faith purchaser or having a bona fide acquisition, um, and whether it was reasonable for people to um, whether it was true that they were acting in good faith, if they had every reason to know that these properties were taken in violation of the constitutional law uh, of the of the um, the prior regime, um, 
who, against whom there had been a, uh, a seizure, an unconstitutional seizure of power. An another concern is, uh, to what extent has the differing result in these, these two countries in Eastern and Central Europe generally had something to do with the relative sympathy that uh, the public at large may have for these uh, different um, third-party beneficiaries, or, or rather for, for the pro pro people whose property was taken. For instance, um, large aristocrats with l major landowning, um, the large uh, properties um, presumably would be less sympathetic in a, in a um, post-1989 um, political situation than, say, small-scale Polish peasants, I would think. Um, and then finally, um, um, I wonder whether it makes any difference whether we're talking about real property, which you all seem to be talking about, as opposed to other kinds of property, chattel or cultural property in particular. Um, the so-called degenerate art seized by the Nazis, for instance, um, became the property of the Third Reich, and uh, as I understand it, uh, then transferred to these third-party beneficiaries, including private art dealers, who um, this is some of whom uh, maintained it for very long periods of time. And yet, with regard to um, art, Jewish-owned art, there's been no question that a full restitution of the works of art themselves would be legally mandatory and have been ordered, uh, that result has in fact been ordered by many courts throughout the Western world. So why the differential treatment of real property and other forms of property? Uh, and I apologize if um, I'm presuming too much in the way of legal knowledge on the part of non-lawyers. Okay, thanks a lot. Who would like to start? Uh, well, if it comes to the first question, I think that my answer will be uh, the shortest one because uh, in the in the issue I described, uh, still a state is the owner of the expropriated land, so uh, there is no uh, third party. However, we can say that the national park, in a sort of, is a beneficiary of of the expropriation. Uh, but well, as I, as I said, national park in some part of uh, uh, of the park is carrying out uh, uh, the protection uh, on the uh, private land. So it clearly shows that it's possible to to do it. So uh, if it's possible in one part of the park, they can do it uh, in the whole park. Uh, that's that's my point. Uh, if it comes to the uh, the uh, different different part of uh, to the uh, property and real property. What's what's the difference? Well, uh, in my opinion, the main difference is that in some situations we uh, can we are not able to avoid uh, expropriation of uh, real property. So, uh, in there will be some situation where it will be uh, able to, to justify the expropriation of real property. While when it comes to, to the other uh, kinds of property, uh, personally, I, I can't find any uh, justification of uh, uh, taking uh, uh, this kind of property unless it's, uh, I don't know, a, a firepower of, uh, or a sort of uh, product like that. So. Uh, but still, uh, the main the main public discussion uh, is uh, is about the um, uh, the real property. So, uh, well, that's that's how it's how it's socially constructed that we we uh, uh, mostly uh, take care about expropriation of real property and do not focus on uh, on the other kinds of property. Well, maybe now after the the, the issue you revoke. Uh, in Germany, uh, there will be a kind of discussion about that, but I I don't see it at, at the moment in Poland, at least. Thank you. Regarding the issue of uh, of current owners, uh, it, in Poland, it uh, very much depends on the. Uh, on the place, but uh, in general, the, the 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 owners who acquired the expropriated property are very well protected by by law. Um, General Jaruzelski acquired uh, property <laughs> expropriated from a uh, uh, from a rough uh, soldier, uh, for example. Um, uh, the issue in Poland is different, uh, particularly in, in in Warsaw, the question of tenants. So not the owners, but and. And actually, right now, uh, uh, the law on uh, restitution of property in Warsaw has been blocked for uh, 40 f uh, for, for 24 years. 
uh, mostly by post-communists, but uh, right now it happened, so, something happened uh, one year ago and suddenly everyone is in favor of the law because of the tenants, because of the tenants who are uh, thrown out of their apartments and it can be solved pretty easily by adopting a law that will allow the, uh, the Warsaw government to give uh, some other property in place of the property that should be uh, should be returned. Uh, so, uh, so there is a political agreement right now. Only there is lack of will to proceed uh, uh, or, or technical ability. Actually, I uh, I uh, gave my opinion on, on a draft law on this uh, on, on the return of property in, in Warsaw. In the Czech Republic, the question of owners was. Uh, uh, decided at the beginning of the 90s when the general law was passed and it was very interesting because there were some uh, uh, clauses there that allowed to strip people who acquired property and who gained them in uh, under duress uh, uh, so mostly uh, high-ranked communists and um, it didn't went uh, it didn't work well i mean they 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 were pretty effective in defending uh, in defending their right there were some cases uh, of, of stripping the, of, of them of property. And regarding the, the arts, this is not a subject in Poland. Uh, in the Czech Republic, they did pass a, a law returning the, uh, the art to, to the former Jewish owners. And uh, it, as far as I know, it, 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 it works pretty, pretty well. Uh, real estate and other property, real estate is obviously easier to locate, so so, so the, the laws uh, usually regarded that. Um, I wanted to take um, uh, answer, take a stab to answer this one because I may give you a b little bit of a different answer. On one hand, I do want to um, echo what has been said that Poland, as a as a society, has not had a conversation about what to do about property restitution in the main. They have not. But on the other hand, when you observe. Um, the actions of the politicians, they somewhat, this is not what they think and this is not what they articulate, but you know, the way that they follow is kind of Rawlsian <coughs> logic. So Rawls wrote, wrote about the uh, property restitution in times of transition and he would say stuff, things like this and he I, distinguishes different types of properties. He says industry should go to the capable managers, which has been done. Whether they have been capable or not is, a, you know, argue with me or with Rawls, but they, the industry has been privatized without any any consideration given to former uh, patterns of ownership. So that's one. Um, sacral uh, property has been returned to the, in a flawed procedure to the churches. The state doesn't want to be maintaining cemeteries. Let, let the churches deal with this. So four commissions have been established. The Catholic Church kind of shut down in infamy. Uh, the other four, three are still going on. And I, they're going. They're going. Um, when it comes to um, real prop property, uh, Rawls is very clear. Um, no, the new state has no obligation toward all the owners, give it to the users. Whoever uses the apartment now should get the deed. Uh, that's his justification, which is not necessarily what is being um, vindicated in Poland in debate, but in act, there, are no appropriate, there is no act of restitution. The politicians are staying clear of this. Uh, so um, th the law on its own, of course, ev er grants restitution on its own logic. But this is done outside of legislative dictum. It's done through a civil law, and it's be done be based on the on the on the um, uh, principle of continuity and on the fact that the, the property under communist times was weakly protected, weakly protected. So if that weak protection was not honored, the former owners can now go and, in a civil case, argue their cases, and the restitution proceeds apace, but not through a lawgiver the lawgiver sort of staying clear of this, thinking it will just work itself out on its own. So in, in reality, although this is clearly not what they are thinking, they're following Rawlsian logic of just uh, allowing the people who own the places, who use the places, own through using, um, keeping them, it, with some exceptions of people who are getting their apartments back. And these are the, the people who, I guess, 
create these quasi-criminal networks. Okay. Would you like to react to? Mm -hmm. Uh, if I may, um, what seems to be interesting to me, um, an interesting institution in the um, German legislative uh, framework, is an institution, Rettliche um, Weiser, acquisition, um, so uh, bona fide acquisition. So um, there was an act which provided um, restitution of property in kind. Um, it contained um, one clause. Um, so if it was acquired uh, in goodwill, I don't know. In I don't know if it's a faithful translation, um, the property would stay with its um, current owner. So um, contrary to in Glaube clause, um, it requires um, the owner to demonstrate um, integrity and good faith and compliance with um, legal regulations from the period of um, German Democratic Republic. So um, not compliant. Um, are all cases of frauds, abuse of one's political and social positions, or a situation where Someone knew that a given person was immigrating to West Germany and wants to sell his or her real estate. Uh, negotiations are opened and an underestimated price um, is achieved at the end um, because of the pressure of time. And also time limits were introduced. Every acquisition um, after the demise of every Honecker was deemed as illegal and incompliant with principles of social integrity. So the legislator wanted to exclude um, situations where uh, state officials who hoped for a quick rise of real estate prices would acquire abusing their position buildings and land so of course um the act does not require people to be 100% honest but you know there are some grounds um to be executed and by the way germany has very special regulations uh, concerning cultural heritage Um, because it's treating it as a public good. And in the transitional period, because regulations were transitional um, in Germany, so for the period of 20 years, uh, compulsory and free right to use cultural goods that were subject to restitution were introduced. Um, um, tribunal um, deemed that this clause is compliant with the Constitution, um, cultural good or public goods. Of course, you can contest it, you can discuss it, but um, the Federal Constitutional Court did not want to limit the right to property um, by regulations, um, which would, after 20 years later, subject those cultural goods to um, the compulsory um, right of use. The tr German tribunal said it's not possible to impose um, compulsory right to use. And Katarzyna, you wanted to comment. Yes, um, the first question regarded good or ill faith of buyers of third persons, because theoretically, situation is clear. Bonafide or goodwill is when you are able to find information about the real estate. For example, in case of Birut's decree, um, it's a situation where you are able to find out that there are claims related to a given building because um, 
in in this case, situation is not that clear. Sometimes, you know, the proceeding is launched, but does it mean that you are acting in ill faith? You know, this way we are shifting the burden of property restitution onto a third person because this person may be acting, um, demonstrating belief and confidence in the state which is selling the property. Perhaps this person is thinking that um, the decree um, cleared all problems, what will be confirmed in the future. So uh, to put it simply, um, why would otherwise a municipality city sell an apartment or a house that um, would have to be uh, restituted? I think it's a fair assumption to be taken by individuals and institutions. You know, people. As far as I'm aware, several questions. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Well, okay, so we can, because if, if we have more than three, then I would collect them. But right now I just three, say it. So Professor Charnota, please. Thank you very much. One of the <coughs> things which actually I miss in the presentation about property here is the ethical character of the real property. Actually, it seems to me that in the Polish literature, Gazina Skomska wrote about it in relation to the, to the restitution of property to the Wemsks, right? It means what she claimed, my memory is short, right? So <coughs> I'm old guy. But what she claimed, well, I remember, that, that property possesses not, not real property, land, right? Possesses not only economical dimension here, but the ethical as well. So what I want to know is, especially from Martin Vrubel, it seems to me, and in relation to the Warsaw resti claim to restitute property, could you identify some sort of the moral dimension of these claims to restitute property? And the second part, more important part, is to cage, right? I don't understand. On the one hand, you started to tell us <laughs> that memory is connected with a, with a presence which means with a network of interests, of the struggle of interests in the present, not with the past. Then you say sometime, then you claim that as long as there is a conflict of memories, then the struggle between the con competing memories, there is a, well, some sort of the dynamics. But later on you claim is a doxa. Doxa as a not existing type of the outside consciousness, basically, right? And I don't think so, because in the, if, if you start with the presence, which means the memory, there will be always conflict of competing memories. Why? Because in the presence you've got a conflict of interest. Then connection, causal connection between law and the memory as such. Well, I, it seems to me that from the legal theory point of view only, not maybe legal sociology point of view, law depends on, on some narratives. And these narratives provi provide law with what? With a normative coherence, which means non-conflict inside legal system actually is not due to the technicalities of law, but acceptance of one dominant narrative which provide normative coherence to the legal system. And if so, it seems to me, there is a no causal relation, but it's sort of the, you know, law depends on memory, memory depends on law. And that's my suggestion at the moment. But my advantage is that I haven't read your paper yet. Thank you. If I may, just a couple of words. I'll be very brief. Dam Państwu odpowiedzieć i na końcu zada Pan pytanie, dobrze? As we do not have a lot of time, I will uh, answer very shortly. Well, I didn't mention that uh, for the community living in the uh, Podhales of the region, I uh, described uh, actually uh, ownership of uh, property uh, is uh, the ground which constructed the whole uh, community. So it's a, uh, it was a very, very, very crucial issue for uh, those people. Uh, and uh, 
the expropriation of uh, lamps is uh, also very important because uh, the first attempt on uh, the government was uh, not to uh, pay for the expropriated land, but to uh, change the land in uh, uh, Pothale for the land that was expropriated, uh, that was gained by the government by the expropriation of uh, of lamps. So uh, that would uh, that would lead us to uh, splitting uh, very strong and anti-communist, uh, anti-communist uh, oriented community into two parts: one living uh, in uh, Pothale's so region near uh, Krakow, and another one living in uh, eastern Poland uh, on the lands taken from uh, the lamps uh, how how we can uh, how we can uh, evaluate this uh, action uh, from the ethical uh, moral point of view uh, well it's still it's i still work uh, work to give an answer to uh, to that question but uh, but as uh, as far as i can uh, tell uh, in my opinion, I, I would argue that uh, the expropriation wasn't uh, carried out in order to uh, provide National Park with uh, uh, appropriate means of, uh, uh, of uh, protection of natural environment. And it was aimed in uh, splitting the uh, community and uh, it was aimed in uh, actually hitting it in a, in a very fragile uh, point. So uh, we can obviously uh, evaluate it uh, highly negatively. Am I next? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so I will take the second question uh, first. The mutual constitution between law and memory, absolutely yes, no, difficult, no, no disagreement for me, but um, in, in this paper I was trying to work out a theoretical connection that would not be messy, so I just bracket one, one of the relationships out. I'm not necessarily saying that the memory does not affect law, of course it does, but I was only interested in, in, in half of the story, um, so I, 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 I left it outside. The second, your first question, I have to go slow because this is, this is, this is not, um, this is, and I'll answer it with two very, very short stories. So in North America, or rather in US, there is no political will uh, to pay restitution for crime, for, for slavery. Okay, so there is no, polit so this is a current, current doxa, if you will. There is no willingness to pay restitution. And this restitution is buttressed in courts and otherwise by a remembrance of two fixes, okay? The first fix happened at, rest, at, uh, at, um, at the time where rest, um, slavery was abolished, if you can call it a fix, but that's how it exists. And the second fix happened during the civil rights uh, movement in the 60s. So here the, you can see a kind of a negative use of memory where we remember slavery being fixed and therefore no longer an issue. And, and, and this buttresses the kind of hegemonic version of the story. If we chose, if there was a political will to pay that restitution, we would all of a sudden remember that the effects of slavery, the evil effects of slavery, continue to this day. That's the formulation that it starts with this willingness to, retribute, to, to restitute or not. Um, and if the second story I can give you will be in Poland, where I would call, the, which kind of exists in a paradigm of anti-communism, and this paradigm remembers, the hegemonic paradigm remembers communism or pe times of peril as moderately evil, moderately evil. Now, this is, this is, um, uh, it, this is a, a language that um, delegitimizes leftist critique of the transition and far-right critique of the non-transition. So the left cr cr critiques and the left has no voice, no public voice in Poland because it is seen as radical and it critiques the neoliberal bent of the transition and the far-right claims that no transition took place because they want to hang every person that has ever held. A so, so, no, so the far-right claims there was no transition but they are pathologized and the far right is radicalized and the and both of them will have a different moral valuation of the communist past the left may be a little bit less 
evil and the far right totally evil. So here I'm trying to give you the, the, the idea that this is, the, it, there is a conversation that, that, ha, that excludes and ex includes and law is implicit in, the, in, in both. I hope I answered the question. Okay. Would you like to react or no? Okay, so we have one more question. Dobrze, poproszę pana o pytanie. Yes, the floor is yours. Richard Herpowicz, ja mam pytanie. I have a question to Katarzyna. Katarzyna, I'm interested in a relation between memory and knowledge, as you know very well. After the Warsaw Uprising, many documents in archives were simply uh, disappeared in fires and memory is fallible, whereas knowledge may be a manipulation. There was an eminent Polish historian, Paweł Wieczorkiewicz, and I asked him right before his death, I asked him how he assessed younger and older generation of Polish historians, and he said that he admired historians of the younger generation who are trying to prove that the past is changing and it is a manipulation. Memory is fallible and knowledge may be manipulated. So the issue of credibility and credible documents in Warsaw, surveying documents, like, for example, Foxal, and when you think about property rights of the plots of one house, well, there was one owner, but then the building was rebuilt thanks to taxpayers, and now there is a person who believes that he has claims because it belonged to his predecessors. So there are different manipulations between memory and knowledge. Thank you. Thank you for this question. It is not an easy question. Perhaps I should do it like this. I do not. I'm not saying that documentation should be fuller. Ah, well, well I, I know, I know that documentation should be credible, but it doesn't has to be, doesn't have to be a written documentation, as we do with the borderland property. You have to allow our panelists to answer. As for compensation the, for the borderland property, there are special guidelines of the Constitutional Tribunal and every bit of information is gathered about the borderland property. Of course, witnesses may be dead, but there might be other sources, not necessarily official documents, that can corroborate the rights of individual persons, the property as to different settlements between the state or costs incurred by the state for rebuilding different buildings which were erected on the plot. I, I do agree that there must be some settlements, but there is still the law and basic institutions of the law like uh, statute of limitations, perhaps in the new law, the law on reproduction, this problem will be somehow solved. And perhaps some institutions, public institutions, like schools, may remain on the plots, on the claimed plots. That would be uh, like done in return for the fact that it was erected there. It is very difficult to estimate costs in CADs for erecting different structures, erecting different buildings. It is difficult to estimate estimate the past costs because we have to remember about the condition of the building at the moment of the transfer of property rights. Of course, it is a task for the legislator to bring some order into these matters in a way 
that will be just and seems that just to all the parties involved. To everyone for uh, for listening to the panel, I would like to say thanks to the speakers for great presentation and for being on time. Uh, and uh, well, I would like to remind everyone that at 6.30 p.m. we have the highlight of the conference, the keynote of Professor Elazar Bakan. And now we have half of an hour coffee break. Thank you.